Hey guys, so this video is designed to go along with the course notes written by myself and Dr. Hartley on asthma. So we're largely going to cover the pathophysiology that um, leads to the symptoms that we expect to see in an asthmatic patient, as well as the immune pathways behind that pathophysiology. So certainly you can apply what's happening in the patient to the um, immune pathways, but the other place that you might apply the immune pathways is when you think about treatment. So um, Dr. Bradrick is going to tell you about a lot of drugs, um, that, and some of them will combat the immune pathways. So when you talk to uh, Dr. Hartley about this, she basically says that when you're thinking about treating an asthmatic, you can think of it in two ways. Um, if asthma is the constriction of the um, alveoli, you can relax the uh, smooth muscles, so you can let out the constriction, or you can treat what's happening inside that's making them con contract. Um, so I think of it a lot like, you know, trying to fit into a dress or something. So I can let out the seams, um, which, you know, will only go so far before I start causing some problems, or I can lose weight. So the option is you can reduce the inflammation, or you can relax how much the bronchioles are contracting. So let's go a little bit more into what asthma is and how it presents. Okay, so asthma is a chronic inflammatory syndrome of the airways. Um, it is basically mediated by both the innate and the adaptive immune responses. Um, and for a fairly simplistic definition of a disease, it's just a chronic inflammatory syndrome, it's actually a very um, kind of elegant and um, interesting disease that we're still kind of wor working out all of the pathways of. So you'll see that in some cases we have a lot of information on the pathways, and in other cases I say like, and the cells are just there. And that's because we don't really know what they're doing yet. Um, when we think about asthma, we actually think about three things. Inflammation, bronchial hyperresponsiveness, and an intermittent or reversible airflow obstruction. And um, this reversible airflow in obstruction is true at first, but the longer a patient has disease, the more considerable this edema can become. Um, and that can be uh, something that's very difficult to deal with. And this is actually a marked difference between asthma and COPD. So in asthma, this airflow obstruction is largely reversible. In COPD, the obstruction is permanent and often progressive. So that's one way we can kind of differentiate these two chronic inflammatory diseases of the airway. Um, the bronchial hyperreactivity is the tendency of the smooth muscle to contract. And in people with asthma, they can react to all sorts of stimuli, both specific ones like allergens or nonspecific ones like the cold. Um, if you ever have difficulty breathing when you're running outside in cold air, um, you might have some form of nonspecific stimuli there. Um, it can also lead to mucus overproduction, airway remodeling, and airway narrowing eventually as the inflammation continues over the course of years. And the results of these events within the airways is both acute and a chronic inflammatory process. So you have this acute mechanism, which is kind of like an asthma attack, um, which is where you're going to get this specific tightening of the airway that makes it very difficult to breathe. Um, but there is also this underlying chronic inflammatory process that makes you more likely to have this um, contraction of the smooth muscle. So what are we thinking about when we think of a patient with asthma? They're more likely to have a cough. Wheezing is com common. And like I said, that difficulty breathing, um, sometimes a, a chest tightness. Um, I don't know how many of you have asthma, but I have asthma. And when I'm having a really difficult time breathing, it'll also kind of sometimes feel almost like my chest doesn't want to expand as well as it should. Um, tech, uh, you can have um, changes in heart rate, um, tachypnea, tachycardia, tachycardia um, and like I said before, this increased mucus production. And the, the sputum and the mucus can actually contain things that are indicative of the increased mucus production. So in the sputum, we'll see these Kirschman spirals. These are literally spiral-shaped mucus plugs. So what do I mean by that? I mean that the mucus has been overproduced in such a way that it filled the um, small bronchi and created almost like a cast, like it's a plaster of Paris of your bronchi. And then it became dislodged 
and that's coming out in your sputum. That's a Kirschman spiral. Um, what's dangerous about that is that these mucus plugs will actually um, cause problems with airflow, right? Because it's literally plugging where we expect air to come in and out. And Dr. Channing can certainly tell you a lot more about that than I can. Um, so the mucus can also contain these Charcot-Leiden crystals. These are literally sharp needles formed from the breakdown of eosinophils. Eosinophilia is one of the um, most prominent characteristics of asthma. We'll talk about the role of eosinophils in the asthmatic um, symptoms in the next slide. But as they break down, you get these Charcot-Leiden um, crystals. The other thing that we sometimes see is pulsus paradoxus. This is a fall of more than 10 millimeters of mercury in the systolic arterial pressure during inspiration. Um, this happens when there is lung hyperinflation, and that compromises the left ventricle filling. Um, this occurs along with augmented venous return to the right ventricle during the vigorous inspiration. Um, so basically, we're just not moving um, the blood through the body as effectively as we should. Um, and that leads to these changes. Um, you can also see a decrease in systolic pressure during inspiration, and that's literally just a consequence of the decreased output that occurs. So what else do we kind of need to think of when we're thinking about a patient with an asthma attack? So remember, we're talking about three things, airway inflammation, um, muscle hyperresponsiveness, the smooth muscle hyperresponsiveness, the airway narrowing, and then when you have the airway narrow, that increases the airway resistance, right? So that significant, um, oh, I can't spell resistance, there we go, that increases significantly. And when we think about normal physiologic circumstances, there's this small caliber um, peripheral airways that don't really contribute significantly to the airflow resistance. So that's okay. But in an asthmatic patient, these airways are kind of a site of really increased resistance. And that gets worsened as you get these mucus plugs into these um, areas. And that actually leads to further bronchoconstriction. So when we think about asthma attacks, you're kind of thinking about two different ways of thinking about it. You've got mild and you've got severe. In a mild asthma attack, the patient might hyperventilate, and that can lead to low PCO2 in their ABG. Um, if a patient is having an asthma attack and they have a normal PCO2, it's actually considered an ominous sign of an impending respiratory muscle fatigue. So that's just something to kind of keep an eye on as you're um, assessing a patient for an asthma attack. During a severe asthma attack, the airway obstruction actually persists, which can cause muscle fatigue. And that will actually result in hypoventilation and hypercapnia. Um, and this can occur in, when the patient is tachypneic um, as a result of breathing, um, not always reflecting the degree of alveolar uh, ventilation. And occasionally you'll see a VQ mismatch, which leads to hypoxia. Um, and the bronchial hyperresponsiveness, you can actually verify that through um, testing with an FEV1 um, and seeing a decrease of 20% um, in response to a provoking factor, like a trigger, right? So those are kind of the symptoms and the signs of the two types of asthma attack that we most often are likely to um, encounter and just asthma in general. Okay, so there are, there are largely two separate forms of asthma that were originally described. Um, but I don't want you to think of these things as completely um, distinct from each other. I want you to think of them more on a spectrum, okay? So I give you these terms extrinsic and intrinsic, right? Um, extrinsic largely refers to IgE-mediated, um, somewhat allergy-induced asthma, right? Whereas intrinsic asthma is you don't have an allergy, you have no history of atopy, um, but you still have this kind of nonspecific tendency toward an asthmatic response. Um, and we used to kind of think of them as distinct diseases, but now they exist more on kind of like a spectrum with each other. So there could be, you could have a patient who has pretty much just only allergy induced asthma or somebody who has no history of allergy um, and shows asthmatic symptoms. Or you could have somebody who has, you know, some level of mild seasonal allergies that is more prone to difficulty breathing and chest tightness in the cold. 
Um, it's not that they are allergic to the cold, no matter what anybody from Florida tells you. It's just that they have some sort of difficulty breathing that is being exacerbated by nonspecific triggers in a patient who probably has some sort of mild underlying um, atopy. Um, so there's a lot of variation, and these variations are classified into different asthma endotypes, and each of the endotypes has kind of a distinct pathophysiology and immunopathogenesis. Um, and the way patients get them actually ranges. Um, it obviously has some sort of genetic um, uh, component because there is a significant allergy um, association. There's certainly environmental risk factors. We see this um, if we look at like the hygiene hypothesis, um, where you know children who spend a lot of time with around a lot of allergens wind up having a lower incidence of asthma and allergy than you know us city-born kids. Um, particularly uh, children who spend a lot of time around diesel fumes have a high in higher incidence of asthma. Um, how old the patient is plays a huge role. Um, typically, patients with intrinsic or you know non-specific asthma are diagnosed later, where patients with allergic or atopic asthma um, tend to be diagnosed as kids. And the prognosis and response to standard therapies all play into this. So I tell you these terms not because as a clinician, you are going to see a patient and go, ah, this patient has extrinsic asthma. It is highly unlikely that you will use these terms. Um, but there's kind of two reasons. One, you might see them terms used in the literature. Um, it is a way that the disease is discussed. Second, I'm hoping that this will provide you some structure to learn the pathways that mediate the immunopathogenesis and treatment of asthma. So what are we talking about with extrinsic asthma? we're largely talking about allergic asthma. So this should already trigger a couple of things for you. One, if it's allergic, it's mostly type one. However, we're getting IgE. Anytime you have something besides IgM, that means CD4 is helped out, which means there's some type four component as well. It's a little bit of a mixed response and the field is somewhat split. But the thing you need to know is that it's tied to atopy or allergy. And because of that, we're gonna see an increased IgE serum level. Um, or you're going to have shown some previous response to some sort of allergen. A really big culprit for this one is house dust mites. Um, most people are allergic to them. I'm allergic to them. Um, and uh, they tend to be a bit of a trigger for asthmatic responses. Um, there are a whole bunch of subtypes of it. We're largely going to focus on atopy. Um, some patients do have some sort of occupational exposure that it can act as a specific trigger for their asthmatic symptoms. Um, Dr. Poole is going to talk to you a bit about allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis. All I'm going to say about this for now is that aspergillosis is a um, disorder that results from infection with a fungal infection called aspergilla, aspergillus. Um, I will be talking about that more specifically in um, your next case, your Zadie Johnson case. So just kind of stay tuned and try to think about those two things together after you get that material. Um, as I said before, uh, um, extrinsic asthma develops earlier in life. It's largely diagnosed in children. Um, and then just because you were diagnosed as a children doesn't mean it go as a child doesn't mean it goes away when you're 18. It's the gift that keeps on giving. You'll have it for the rest of your life. Um, and there is significant eosinophilia associated with extrinsic asthma. So we worried about eosinophils and then also mast cells. Um, basophils play a role in it as well, as you'll see. And the role of basophils in mast cells is actually augmented by the IgE that we see elevated in the serum. Intrinsic asthma, because it isn't associated with allergy, you don't really need any personal or family history of an allergic response. And as I said, a lot of people are actually diagnosed later in life with this one. They're going to have norm, normal serum IgE levels, and you've got these nonspecific triggers, smoking, the cold, um, exercise-induced asthma is typically considered intrinsic asthma. Um, aspirin in some patients can act as kind of a non-specific trigger for asthma. I list viral infections here. The thing with viral infections, and we'll talk about this more later, is that all asthmatics have an increased susceptibility to viral infections. However, we list it as a trigger in intrinsic asthma because when patients have a viral infection and they are also an asthmatic, they have a higher suscept or a higher likelihood of having a more severe um, course of the infection. They are more likely to experience asthma exacerbations as a result of the infection as well. And because it's intrinsic, the pathways are a lot more unclear. 
there's certainly eosinophilia that we see here, but there can also be a kind of neutrophil-driven form of disease. And the neutrophil-driven form of disease is often augmented by a Th17 phenotype because Th17 cells produce a lot of IL-17, which recruits neutrophils. Okay, so let's go through kind of the pathways for how this work, works. For extrinsic asthma, it was previously considered kind of the hallmark Th2 disorder for the longest time. Um, basically, you get increased numbers of Th2 cells. And remember, Th2 cells secrete this uh, combination of cytokines, a lot of IL-4, a lot of IL-5. They also can secrete IL-13. And then the other one we talked about in host defense, host response was IL-10. IL-10 doesn't really play a huge role in asthma, so we're kind of going to ignore it for now. Um, but IL-4, IL-5, and IL-13 are kind of a big deal for asthma. So what happens is you have this allergen that is taken up by dendritic cells in your lung parenchyma um, or gets through through goblet cells, whatever. This leads to some sort of stress in your airway epithelium, and the airway epithelium is going to secrete its own cytokines, IL-33, 25, and TSLP. You don't need to know the names. You just need to know that the airway epithelium is reacting and secreting inflammatory cytokines. This is going to promote this inflammatory environment. The um, dendritic cell will present this to a nearby naive T cell. And because of the environment, the um, kind of the cytokines that are present and the way the antigen is presented, the cell will become a Th2 cell. So what does that mean? Well, one, it's going to produce its own IL-4, IL-5, and IL-13. IL-4, IL-5, and IL-13 will help activate and maintain mast cells. Remember that from your Foundations of Medicine block. IL-4 and IL-13 from the Th2 cell will also instruct B cells to make some IgE, right? The IgE can then go bind on the mast cells. Then the next time the allergen comes in, just like we saw in allergy, the allergen acts to cross-link these IgEs that are bound on FC epsilon receptors on the mast cell, and the mast cell degranulates, kicking out a whole bunch of stuff, okay? You also have IL-5 and IL-13 that are doing other things. So IL-5 will also support the recruitment and activation of eosinophils, which can also degranulate. And IL-13 will also lead to um, smooth muscle contraction which leads to that bronchial hyperreactivity, right? So beyond that, when I talk about mast cells and eosinophils degranulating, they're gonna release cytokines. Some of them are IL-4 and IL-5, but they'll also release leukotrienes and chemokines and histamines and prostaglandins. Um, the prostaglandins and leukotrienes, specifically for leukotrienes, LTP4 um, and the cysteine LTs, cis LTs, these are going to cause your smooth muscle contraction um, and also increase microvascular permeability and airway mucus um, secretion. So it's really going to contribute to what we were talking about earlier. You've got inflammation, mucus secretion, and um, smooth muscle contraction, and that's the hallmark of asthma. Um, so all of these things together are how we're going to get extrinsic atopic asthma. Um, the eosinophil also will produce things like neurotoxin and major basic protein and eosinophil peroxidase proxidase, and those are going to lead to the actual structural damage to the lung cells and eventually airway remodeling. So that, I mean, the allergic form of asthma is very well thought out. So if we go over to intrinsic and non-atopic asthma, that gets a little more difficult to figure out, right? Because we don't even really know what the trigger is right away, because, you know, another person in the room will have no problem with it. We can't always identify it. But when we think about it, this is a form of asthma that is not dependent on Th2 or IgE responses. So we're really going to think about two things. So once again, our airway epithelium is going to get perturbed by some form of IL-33, IL-25, TSLP coming out of these epithelial cells. These cytokines, once again, you don't have to know the names, just know that there's some sort of inflammatory environment, are going to be bound by an immune cell I haven't told you about yet. This is called the innate lymphoid cell. Um, these are just kind of inflammatory cells that have recently been discovered. They're not antigen specific, but they can react to the inflammatory environment around them. What they're going to do is produce a lot of IL-5 and a lot of IL-13. The IL-5 is once again going to induce that eosinophilia that is associated with asthma. And the IL-13, you guessed it, is also going to support that bronchial hyperreactivity. So that's actually pretty simplistic. 
Um, the other way it can happen is actually a neutrophilic dependent disease. In some patients, we don't see Th2 um, and eosinophilia, we see neutrophils. Um, and what's scary about that really is that this neutrophil mediated disease tends to be a bit more severe um, and less, um, less able to be controlled by some of our standard treatments, specifically steroid treatments. The cytokine production by the Th17 cells, which is going to recruit the neutrophils to the site, is notoriously uh, steroid resistant. But basically it works the same way. The neutrophils are causing inflammation that's leading to um, mucus secretion and airway hyperreactivity. So that's kind of the immuno um, pathogenesis behind the two diseases. So I just want to touch base really quickly on how um, patients are more susceptible to respiratory viral infections. So if you look on the left here, this is kind of a normal antiviral response. Virus comes in, monocytes are recruited, they gobble it up. They're probably going to present um, and um, present antigen in the lymph node and make some Th1 cells and some CD8 cells and get some NK cells on board as shown here. But in the meantime, they're going to produce a lot of type 1 interferons, which are going to interfere with the viral replication. And so that's why, you know, you're going to get over this relatively mild infection in no time. Um, in patients with asthma, you can actually get significant asthma ex exacerbations from relatively mild viruses like human rhinovirus, RSV, which obviously in kiddos is a big deal, but in adults, not such a big deal. Um, influenza, which while it feels really bad, most people can recover from. So in kids, HRV is actually associated with persistent wheezing. And when you have this persistent wheezing in a kid, it's actually a strong risk factor that they'll develop asthma. Um, and even in well-controlled asthmatics, recovery from a mild viral infection is often prolonged. Um, so what happens is, in this case, because you have this high Th2 environment, remember that anytime you have Th2, you're actually kind of suppressing Th1. So this high Th2 actually reduces the ability of the cells around it to produce enough type 1 interferons, and even type 2 interferon gamma included here, to effectively interfere with viral replication. Um, you also have a lot of IgE, which is kind of just leading to these cells being non-specifically um, activated, including your eosinophils and your mast cells. So you kind of have this underlying inflammation going all the time, but it's the wrong kind of inflammation. It's completely ineffective at fighting the virus. So you're trying to fight this virus, but you have this non-specific inflammation that's going to lead to um, the bronchial hyperreactivity, um, and then increased mucus, which can actually be helpful in a virus to help carry it away, but not if you can't get it out. Um, and that's actually what leads to this bronchial hyperreactivity is what actually leads to the exacerbations during the viral infection and the prolonged recovery from viral infections as well in asthmatics.